When folks first think about working in games, they're oftentimes thinking about starting at their favorite AAA company or maybe an indie dev. One option that might not be considered as frequently or even well known are co-developers. Co-developers are companies that come to supplement the work of studios in progress, kind of like calling in reinforcements. Our next speakers are here to give us the ins and outs of co-development, as well as some tips and tricks if you think that working for a co-developer might be for you. A game designer for Pipeworks Studio and an associate design manager respectively, please welcome to the stage Monica Fan and Ken Barnes. Hello everyone, this is Monica. Um, and today me and Ken are gonna talk about Guns for Hire, the pro and cons of being a Kodak game designer. Um, first of all, who we are and why we are talking about this. Uh, I am Monica, I'm original from China. Now I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am right currently working as a game designer at Pop Pipeworks Game Studio. Um, my specialty is system and gameplay design, although I do a little bit of everything. Um, I am very passionate about accessibility and inclusivity design. Um, my experience expands through multiple device and platform um, and scales. I work on AAA and indie and a lot of different uh, technologies that are both uh, including like the everlasting technology like PC and console and like some upcoming ones like VR, AR, as well as uh, mobile, especially in the peak when mobile was like the big thing everyone was working on. Um, I have, before I was a game designer, I have experience in QA production, comedy manager, and local localization. Uh, right now, I am very involved in a lot of game dev and advocacy space, including being the founder of IGD and Neurodivergent Game Dev SIG, um, as well as the, being one of the leaders in Save Point Gathering, as well as firm. Um, when I'm not doing video game related stuff, I enjoy um, consuming K-pop uh, content as well as reading a lot of comics. As you can see, I also uh, live with my cat. His name is Cyril, and he's a big source of inspiration and motivation for what I do. I just realized both of our cats have Z names. That's Suey and Zero. That's that is actually amazing. Double Z. Um, Oh, it's my turn. Hi, it's me. I'm Ken. Uh, following up Monica, who does everything at all the times, which is somewhat amazing, I gotta say. I am not entirely certain you sleep. Um, I am a person of all trades. Uh, I, I have done production, I have done design, and I have been doing game dev for... It's in the decades. It's in the multiple decades. I'm just gonna stop I'm going to be, that's as exact as I'm going to be about that. Um, mostly I am a gender agnostic smarty pants that is good at finding solutions to process issues. Um, but I did all kinds of things before that. Uh, right now, though, I really try my best to bring like design back to a, a human centered and, and not entirely like uh, like metric centered place, um, which is not to say that I don't rely on data. It's just that that data needs to be helpful for players and developers to inform what they do and help them enjoy themselves better or do better jobs. Um, and as for my personal interest and stuff like that, uh, I am a forever outsider fan. So bring me your, your X-Men, your drag race, your punk rock, uh, basically anything where there is a flashy outsider group fighting for the rights of marginalized peoples, uh, that is my jam right there. And uh, speaking of environments in which marginalized folks can find their way using their own special skills and traits, Monica, let's talk a little bit about, uh, oh, you've got the slide right there. Look at this, the magic, uh, co-development. Uh, and so to lead in on that, the co-development zone is, it's a little bit more responsibility having than the outsourcers zone. Many development companies will just hand, uh, you know, like assets to be made or something like that to another company. Co-development group is when a studio has an idea for what they need to do, but they need to refine that into an actual actionable 
project. And so there are a lot of groups out there that do that sort of thing or that partner with studios to make something together. Um, and these kinds of things can range from either just adding additional staff to those studios existing teams or it can be taking over something entirely like a multiplayer mode or uh or a a, a type of like a ui work and really you don't hear about those studios as often because they're they're not the ip holders they're not the ones that like are responsible for the halo or uh the bungee uh you know themselves but they do a lot of work on those games and so there's a lot of strengths and advantages to looking for one of these co-development studios uh as you're looking for work and as you're finding your way in this crazy development world um monica take us in a little bit deeper yeah so uh what does it mean to be co and why do co-development studio exist um, to quote it, like the design director at Pipeworks, uh, Hal says, we exist because what game company wants to do is bigger than what they could do with existing internal resource. Um, if you are a game developer, which I think a lot of people in, you, in the audience are, you understand game development is very expensive, very unpredictable, and almost always very chaotic. Um, not even counting what is just happening with Unity. It's really hard to, um, when you plan game development, you are usually planning for the next four to six years. And a lot of things could happen. COVID happens. Nobody predicted that. Uh, financial crisis sometimes can happen. Um, what happened? Uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff happens. And also like game develop, video game is made by people. And there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability when it comes to uh, rely on a large group of people to be able to work uh, together. Mm -hmm. Um, and often um, video game, game company, they would design a game that is very big, very exciting, uh, that required them to put a lot of manpower behind the game. But if you are a new AAA company or even an older one, a lot of company may be hesitant to just hire uh, fully staffed up to like have like thousands of like full-time worker uh, right away for two reasons. One is you need to be responsible for those people's lively being after the end of the project and you need to think about how are we going to support all those people after the project ship and how if the project doesn't is not like mega su successful how are we going to find ways to pay those people on the other hand um scale up and expanding is not so easy it require a lot of tutor uh, mentoring a lot of training um and finding the right candidate who actually align with your value so co-development studio happens because there's a lot of triple a and bigger studio they want to make game but they don't have the manpower and the resource and they are hesitant to fully 100 percent invest in that many people when they don't really know the revenue of the company five years down the line. Instead, they were working with code development as like a service to help them shift their game, to help them achieve the dream game, like products they want to make, while also um, mitigate the risk of um, staffing up too fast and of just you know, not having enough seniors to train juniors because when they hire a code development company, they know they're not just hiring people who's their first job. They're hiring people who has been proper mentored, who has the skill and who is flexible enough to help you to do the work that you want to do. Exactly. And um, code development, like, like, Ken just said co-development is not outsourcing and also co-development is not a flat hierarchy. They're usually, we like we will work with clients who require us to do certain co-development, but often we will also work with other outsourced or other co-development company to take it over. It's, it's a collaborative work between multiple companies trying to build the best game products. And some of the requests you often see as a co-development company 
are the following. We have a lot of co uh, tech companies, they're developing new technology and they need game content and interactive content to showcase that their engine or their technology is worth investing and to attract other dev. So they are also often looking for like a co-development company to develop some like content for them to showcase their abilities. Oh, As I wanted well, to, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I did want to add a couple of examples when you're done uh, on, on this stuff. Oh, yeah. So another one is uh, what we said earlier about like content and system is um, a lot of games they develop, to, they've designed a very big game and they need a lot more content and system to make the game uh, complete. And when they don't have enough manpower in their account, in their company to do this, they will ask a co-development company to adapt their pipeline, adapt their design system and content to help making the game uh, to the final stage. Um, sometimes we encounter clients who are just, they're making their first game or they're making their first game in a genre that they're not comfortable or familiar with, and they require some expertise uh, from like people, is, especially when it comes to like live service game, which is very complicated and involve a lot of like networking programming and a lot of like uh, system that um, they will require a consulting or like a supporting system to help them achieve their vision. Um, as well as uh, the last the last cases uh, example, uh, again, this is not just the everything. We, ha we also have a lot more examples. Uh, these are just some of the ones that come out of both to me when I first made the slides. But uh, a lot of time when people release their game and they they expect this game to do to be moderately successful and people are gonna want it, but like not viral, but like suddenly the game got viral. Suddenly the players decide uh, start to find out how wonderful this game is and they demand more. They want more stuff. They want more DLC. They want more update content. They want additional content for season pass. While the studio um, may not want to continue supporting, um, not supporting the game, but like they want to work on something new and they only have so many people in the studio. So they may hire like a co-development service like us um, so we can look at what, they, what their vision for the game, what they want to achieve, and how can we implement additional gameplay content for player uh, within the uh, design as well as their tool set. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, just to, to add a little bit to that, if you're curious about what more co-development studios look like concretely, you can absolutely uh, pull out your favorite games. And this stuff's actually sit through the credits this time. You know, it's a big, it's a lot, it's a commitment I'm asking of you. But uh, you may be surprised. Like, you will find that if you sit there and look at the credits for um, Dark Souls Remastered or Final Fantasy XII, that you will spot the studio Virtuos in there. And they're helping with those kinds of systems. Uh, Crusader Kings uh, behind Paradox. You've got Ringtail Studios helping them do that sort of thing. Um, you've got Studio Gobo, who helps with big multiplayer things like for honor for example um so really if you dig in some of the especially in some of the larger budget games you'll start to find the names of some of these smaller studios and you can go and track what's going on with them and see what other projects they've got uh and explore whether or not there's like career opportunities for you there as well um because there are a lot of them that have the virtue of to put it concisely, let me see if I can get this right, and Monica, correct me if I'm off target on it, but like as a as a development group, if you've had to staff down, uh, you may find that, for example, now you have to staff up to handle a bigger project, but if you just hire people, they're all brand new, and they're going to need to unwrap, and it's going to take time to get them to the level of proficiency and the level of team dynamic that'll let them make the product that you, you really want to see. Um, but when, uh, one thing that is a benefit from going to a co-development studio, which is the choice that these guys make sometimes, is that at least you have a team of functional people at that studio. They may be new to your project, but they have history working together and skills that they've attained. And so sometimes that ends up being the best solution for some of these larger groups. Uh, it looks like employment is going to continue to be volatile as we surf the rocky seas of this next couple of years. But um, co-development is 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 going to be a thing that is going to be around for 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 the foreseeable future. Um, that was all. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think we as an industry, um, a lot of you guys who are watching probably has this experience um, is uh, we send a lot of junior to the industry, but we don't support them. We don't mentor them. And then uh, a couple of years later, we blame them for not having the skill and left them to dry. So co-development part of it is to like try to fix the retention and also like help train people so when you join the industry you don't feel like you're fighting for your life alone and we create a family for you to, <laughs> to learn and to grow um the pros and cons of the co-development Co-development is low profile. The studio won't always have their own flagship title or strong brand identity. And here are some of the things uh, you may encounter that may make you a little bit teary. Yeah, right. Uh, so at the, at the higher levels, of course, a lot of co-development studios have the issue where once someone has gotten some titles under their belt and they've got some experience, uh, a lot of their seasoned folks will then go, okay, now I want to head over to Santa Monica or now I want to head over to some other studio that's like that's got my favorite character in it or that has uh, developers that I esteem that I want to work with. Um, so that'll be an issue because those are the people that are the best at kind of improving your studio's projects and processes. So you're going to keep losing those skilled people as you go, which is kind of a bummer because like that's that's a lot of knowledge disappearing. But on the other hand, Monica? Yeah, uh, there's always hiring at entry level. And also, like I said earlier, it's they don't just hire entry level people and give you a bunch of work and be like, I'll check back in a year and hopefully you learn how to do. We actually uh, co-develop them, like at least in the company I work with, you always have um, a lot of support. And as a junior, as someone who's relatively junior, when we, oh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> when I started, uh, it was really helpful because I don't just get to learn. I, I get to work with many different senior and I get to see like, different designers different habit different a lot of designer they will tell you things like as if like this is the truth then you will talk to someone else and they were <laughs> like oh maybe like that's just their experience it's not necessarily there if they're really not that many universal truths uh or universal like um <laughs> like standard for game design the fun and joy of game design is it's very different than case by case. And as a junior, it's very helpful because I get to learn with different people. I get to see how different people achieve their dream career and how they get there. And I get to learn um, the pros and cons working at different companies and the different, like, I am not, like, working at Pipework means I'm not stuck at doing one genre. I always do different genre, different games, and I get to see, like, how the different design standard and learn different audience and what it's like to, like, working in this, like, one genre versus the other. And to me, it's, it's really interesting. And also, as someone who starting career and relatively new, it allows me to see a lot and to make decisions about where do I want to be in five, ten mm -hmm. years. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's it's got a lot of strength, especially if you're at an entry level looking to build your resume and add add titles to your history. Um it's it's gonna be a bummer if you have a really special like a personal vision that you are trying to execute on. That's that's not gonna go as well for you. And that's kind of true at entry level in the industry, regardless. But uh if you wanna be the person who just does the VFX for a specific title and you just want to like home in on your your shaders and stuff that's not going to be the life at a codev studio uh you are going to have to learn all the things because there won't ever be like a, a standard committed staff that has been there for that project for many years for you to lean on everybody has to kind of like every six months to two years shift up and take responsibility for different things sometimes the project you're on doesn't have a VFX guy at all, and then you will be in there. Or sometimes it has three VFX people, and then you need to figure out what you bring to the table to boost that, or alternately, how you can facilitate what those people are doing. Maybe it's by tools, maybe it's by your organizational skills, but the needs on any given project are gonna be different. So you're gonna have to 
learn different things but on the plus side you're gonna have to learn different things um and I'll also lead in on this one and then hand it back over to you, Monica. Uh, the 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 uh, double-edged sword here too is that a lot of these bigger groups, like uh, you know, if there is a a riot or an Activision, they uh, regardless of what the situation is on the floor, often media events can stimulate us to react and try and improve ourselves in our public perception. And so a lot of those studios have stuff in flight that is intended to improve the level of representation in the studio and in their games and the level of accessibility that's presented. Um, but if they are not <laughs> on the receiving end of a lot of negative PR attention, maybe they're not doing that. And sometimes that's what it takes to get them going. Whereas with a co-development studio, often they may not have gotten to some of those processes because they, they're not in front of the camera is often they don't receive as much attention you don't really know who they are and so people tend not to point uh too much negative attention at them but that means that by going in there and being that representation you might have opportunities to make it better just because you may be some of the first people to go in there and ask for or push for or create solutions for these things yes ab uh, absolutely um one thing I always recommend people who want to join CodeDev is you, you're you not the one who create, you usually work with someone who have the creative vision. And when you want to offer design suggestion um, that is against or disagree, like they don't necessarily agree, you have to be prepared to argue with your point and you have to be prepared to bring evidence and bring like um, to be be able to convince them and using like different tools, visual tools, research data, um, gameplay uh, footage and like different ways to persuade people because a lot of time we deal with, um, part of the reason we do this talk is we not just like to uh, encourage more people to join code development, but also like if you are a first party uh, company, we want to let you know that we really care about your game. and. Um, Sometimes people are more skeptical when an external developer come here and offer design suggestion. So you have to be ready to like argue with your points and understand that you have to overcome like their skepticism. And I think this happens more for us because we are not we're not just like external developer, we're also personal with marginalized identity. And there's not many of us and like five years ago when I first joined the industry, there's a lot of people was very skeptical about my ability to be a game designer because of the way I look and my identity. Um, it can be very disheartening and can be determining and can be like, you know, sometimes you get exhausted, mentally exhausted, but like, um, I always just take rest, risk, uh, take rest and then try to like <laughs> Both. come back and like, keep fighting and eventually like people will recognize the ability and they will give you more opportunities. Um, but it is definitely a journey and especially for people with marginalized identity in the game industry, even to these days, um, which is why you have a diversity issue. <laughs> but I think um, with code development can be a good way for people with who are under uh, represented uh, identity to join the game industry and to be in a voice in the room. Uh, where we may not necessarily go through their original, or like, you know, in-house in hiring because of the way I talk is different from what they're used to. But when they hire us as a external developer, we get to voice our concern. And um, a lot of time in my experience, um, me being there as a woman of color in a room of, full of white men um, is is a strong enough like people become like uh, start to think about what it's like for me to play the game and they start to have more high awareness that not all their gamers are like them and so i think one benefit we get from like so many code like collaboration is we has more that we have a more diverse um demographic in the room when a lot of major decisions are being made also, when uh, I just wanted to not forget to mention that uh, when I was working at Pipeworks and now uh, currently as Monica is working at Pipeworks among the 10 million other things that she is doing is uh, helping to point the employee resource group in the right direction. And they really did not 
have one of those uh, before us. So that's an example of one of those opportunities that you can take to kind of like get these concerns in front of people by your by your presence and start applying yourself to to making some some change in these studios themselves and they need it they need you yes uh then the second project based the pros and cons um the con is you don't really get to work on your project of your choice there's a couple of times where there's some project I was like, oh, it's really it sounds really exciting. And they were like, we don't really need a digital designer right now. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I would just like get sad for a day and go back to what I want to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if I apply to somewhere, you know, where it's like, oh, well, the thing we work on is, you know, Mario, then it's like, great, cool. Like whatever I'm doing is gonna be related. But you can't always count on that. Like whatever your least favorite genre is, you know, there is there is a chance, depending on the code development studio, that you are gonna be stuck doing uh whatever it is that is not your favorite, whether it's FPSs or visual novels or what have you. Uh it it is likely to be something that you're gonna have to figure out how to apply yourself to. Um but on the plus side, uh if any of those things go south, uh, that's not going to tank the entire studio. It's just one project in their portfolio. And so co-development studios are actually a bit more stable in that regard, I would say, than a lot of, especially single project uh, 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 AAA groups. Yes. Uh, one thing, as a junior and the experience, I have experienced this, and a lot of junior I've heard experienced this, is your first job, we were working on, your first couple of jobs, you were working on this really exciting project, and under NDA, and you were like really hoping that the moment NDA lifted, I can share with the world the hard work I've done, and the project got canceled, and the NDA is still there, so now you you have to go to recruiter and be like believe me i really worked on a game for the past year i there's nothing i can show you but trust me i really learned all those stuff um the good thing about code is because by the time project comes to us it's usually they already passed the i'm not sure if they if their skin will ever get shipped stage they have a lot of answer already answered and a lot of time when the clients come to us the game is already announced which um, it's probably it's probably gonna come out um, because unannounced the game is very hard. So you have a much higher chance. I would say every project I've worked on with Pipework end up getting seen by public, which is a very big deal when you're a game dev because a lot of time our career is largely established about uh, based on the project we work on instead of um, the year of experience and the tools you can use. So, uh, uh, yeah, true. it's, it's definitely like, like couple, like last year when there was a lot of game funding, you can see a lot of people, they got funding because they work on one successful game. So having game, having a portfolio with games that people not only heard about, but also played is very, very beneficial for career development. Um, 100%. The, the cons is um, because we always like we work on a new project every year and every year we work on new stuff. And the good thing is we get a show, we get a release like new project every one or two years. The bad thing is um, sometimes you really like the people you work with. And then when the project ends, you have to say goodbye. You don't really, we don't really get to choose who we work with. We don't really get to choose uh, what project we like like what team we get to stay with. So every every time we get, we have to like say goodbye, like every new project, we have to say goodbye to our friends and meet new friends <laughs> and learn like working habits and communication habits and like, and learn everything like again from the beginning. It does get easier though. <laughs> It does get easier. And that's actually a secret advantage for you, despite the sadness, is that one of the things that is also hardest to do is like, even if you have the schooling and the training, breaking in to the industry, right? And like the, there are so many questions and guides out there on like, how do I get into this studio? What, is there something I can do with my resume? Or I will tell you bottom line, like the strongest tool at your disposal to get a gig at a studio is to, know people there that already know your work and are familiar with you and trust you 
that will put you at the top of the stack immediately. And in any industry, it's sort of like, well, how do I make the connections if I don't have the job? How do I how do I get the job without the connections? But one of the advantages of working at co-development studios is that you might have the opportunity to work on like several large franchises. And now if you if your relationship with those teams are good, if the project goes well, then like now you know people at all those bigger studios. You've worked with them, they're familiar with you. And so when it comes time to try applying there again, you have that advantage as well. And that's something that is harder to come by either at a smaller indie group or at one single large place. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the the friends uh, and the people I get to work with are, I get to work with a lot of people I look up to as a junior, as a student, and that was definitely really exciting. Um, the last thing is, which I feel this very, by the time we were recording this, it was like right after a lot of Unity news coming out. Oh and my gosh. I feel so much about the last one is as a code developer, we don't really get to choose our engine and work pipeline. Um, by the time we join a project, a lot of those answers was already established. There's very little chance I can persuade someone to switch engines or switch tools. Um, as a result, um, we, you have to learn many different software and you have to learn how to do different tools. Um, I become very good at learning engine. I become very engine agnostic and very adaptive to any tools, any work pipeline, any new plugged in and stuff. Um, which right now you see a lot of people because what happens with Unity, they are, they are whole experience in Unity and they're worried about like their job prospect. And when you do code dev, because you have so many experience with so many different engine, on one hand it's like, one engine having issue doesn't really impact your job. On the other hand, um, I have no issue learning new engine. I have no issue learning new tools. If a tool just stop working, it's fine. I can just learn new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Super true. Yeah. And you may, you may end up getting experience and stuff that you didn't even know you liked. Like you may end up discovering that you are passionate about tools and things that facilitate people to do the job that you do. You may discover that like you get involved in audio or VO recording and that all of a sudden audio engineering and, and voice directing and narrative is something that's on your radar that wasn't before. So it's actually a really exciting opportunity to learn how to do a bunch of new things. And I don't want to undersell the challenge. It's also hard to always have to be learning new things. But on the plus side, you are adding to your, your skills and you are skilling up in such a way that is going to make you a much higher level dev. And in addition, uh, you may find that you have the opportunity to understand kind of like how things work on a project at a like at a systemic level and go, okay, well, it's not just that I'm I'm having issues on my task. I can see that like, the this asset is moving to this place and it we don't notify that person that that happens when it happens and i can think of a way to organize this better and that's also super useful because that type of like forward thinking and thinking holistically about your project is going to happen uh by just nature of what the work is at a co-development studio but you will find that like when you that translates to other types of work and other places and if you join a team as a person who is aware of your coworkers' needs and understands what they do and understands how to work with them, you're just going to generate a lot more positive interactions and that is going to give you a better time in the industry. Yes. Also, um, if you have the experience in like working chaotic, like adaptive experience, it actually really helped. I worked in many years in theater and live radio and TV before mm -hmm. uh, production, before I joined the game. And I joined Pipeworks because they recognize my ability to um, keep things going in live uh, theater and live uh, show situation, which is very adapt like applicable to being a co-developer is the ability to solve um, problem on the go and not getting stuck by like one difficulty or one restriction. Uh, so yeah, if you have experience in um, live shows, maybe CodeDev will be fit right in for you. <laughs> I would not be giving this talk now with you if if not for you <laughs> letting me know that it existed so I can 100% verify that yes, sometimes meeting cool new people at these kinds of studios will lead you to new opportunities and cooler stuff. Oh, is me. Okay, so we already kind of like led into this a little bit, right? Uh, but 
some of the things that will help you uh, navigate the chaos that is co-development uh, are, for example, actually, top of the list and most importantly uh maybe is that you have to be not afraid to ask questions um this is you know if you like i'm sure in life this is a good thing to have anyway that is a good skill people will tell you that but but really seriously uh it's you may feel a little intimidated especially if you're new to the industry but like because co-development studios are always going to be catching some portion of a project in flight and figuring out how to handle it correctly um none of your questions are stupid all of your questions are valid because everyone around you also needs to figure make sure that they're on the same page and figure out what they're doing so anytime that you are stuck do not do not just sit and and be stuck in stuck land like really just ask the question straight away um it is also a kind of a neat flag that I have perceived is that if somebody is on the team and is like, don't ask questions, don't like, that's yeah, going to look, come off badly. Like that's a, that's a red flag. That is a person that you're going to want to be like, okay, uh, not a collaborator. Good to know. Do not follow their advice. Asking questions is fantastic. Um, also being a bit of a workaholic helps, but, uh, but generally being able to like really kind of like, approach new tasks with excitement and and focus in on what they are and and open yourself to be like you know not oh well i'm gonna do this even though it's not my area but go like hey okay this is a cool new thing that i am now going to learn and i'm gonna kick some butt at um approaching things in that mindset definitely helps me by nature um I hate money, I guess, mostly. <laughs> like, I really, the thing I look for in jobs is like, is it an interesting, is it going to give me interesting puzzles or problems to solve? Are there issues here that like, you know, what is going on with this UI? Oh, well, here we've got a bunch of like, you know, uh, uh, escort tasks. Those always are suck. Why do they suck? Like, is there a thing that we can do to push this forward, to solve this problem and to kind of like contribute to the field, I guess? Um, and so... I really like looking for new challenges and, and new uh, new things to work on, kind of regardless of what they are. So I'm I really you know like that sort of uh, thing, and it, that may not be your strong suit. In which case, you may want to think about whether or not code development is for you. But the benefits of being flexible, I think, will pay off for you in the long run. Um, you will also learn kind of like a little bit about different company cultures and being able to work with other people and adapt to their style and especially do the, uh, oh, here's a, here's another performance thing. Uh, thanks, Monica. Uh, being able to do the yes and model of collaboration where you are not, if you hear something that isn't immediately your favorite suggestion, you don't just go, well, that's bad. Do my thing instead. You know, you, you have an approach that's like, okay, I hear you. I can see what you're aiming for. I understand why you want that thing. Let's talk a little bit about how that thing works and maybe make it stronger um, and then secretly get rid of it and do your thing. No, I'm <laughs> but learning to collaborate in a way that doesn't shut people down, but that brings them in and makes them a part of what you're doing so that you're participating together. Um, that is huge. That's huge in any team environment, but especially in co-development where everyone is often adjusting to having to perform a new different role right now or having to handle a new different set of tasks. Um, so be thoughtful kind of question why and how you're doing the thing and if it is the correct way to do the thing and give those questions to people and get your answers back. And and once you have done that, then go ahead, open mind, open heart, and figure out how to do it in the way that works best, not just for the product, but for the team that is on the product and for the company that you're working with. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to keep in mind, but it these are all this type of, you know, flow like water, uh, flexibility is a huge advantage in co-development. Did I miss anything? No. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I want to add on two things. One is we just say this is like thrive at co-development, but I would say a lot of these qualities are very important, even just as a regular game designer or game mm -hmm. designer of any stage, especially when it's come to like senior or lead level. These are the qualities that will make you a 
be successful and be more likable <laughs> right. than like, because I think a common misconception is game designers are the ideal person while yeah. in reality, game designer are the collaborator and the problem solver. So um, having these skill is very important just as a game designer development in your career. Um, the other thing is the benefit um, I've recently started to real, realize is working with, the benefit of working with co-development company with people because we only we mostly only hire people who fit those qualities as a result it's very pleasant to work with open-minded team workers they let right? me be who i am um i have worked at company where they um i'm neurodivergent and they are not comfortable with my habit of my way of communication but like working with co-development studio everyone is just so open-minded and it's really happy to work there which i think is as i getting older this become more and more important <laughs> when it comes to like career choice and stuff yeah um, honestly the um the, the 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 talented jerk kind of thing is like the longer i'm working the longer i'm like i don't care how many geniuses you have on this team if they can't just work with you in a meeting together like your partners if they can't resist like sniping and 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 creating drama then it's like it's it's not worth it i'll take someone half as skilled um if they can just collaborate because we will go twice as fast because we're not infighting all the time and then the other thing that i just wanted to boost that monica just said is that um of course you're gonna need to be the idea person as a designer of course people are going to come to you for that but it's also not a world where all of your ideas get to live. Like, that's the main thing that I would like to, is, and it's, this is a design specific uh, observation, but the role that you are, you're not, you're not the secret visionary. The role is that you are getting everyone together on the same page about what you're doing. Everyone, art, engineering, production, they will all have input and ideas and some of them will be good and some of them will be not so good and your job is really not just to impress everyone with your ideas but to make sure that everyone knows what the core ideas are and that if they even if they don't agree with them they understand the goal of the thing that you're designing and that they all understand that enough to do their jobs that they're, that they're not blocked by not understanding parts of what you're working on together so really you are as much a uh, a herald and a banner uh to assemble upon as you are an idea machine do keep that in mind because it, it's actually kind of crucial um and as we're, we're we're almost getting up to the end of it so i am gonna sit back and chill and let monica handle this slide um which is a lot of fun and uh talks a little bit about expanding your horizons even beyond the country that you're in yeah um i i have a lot of feeling about this because i'm originally from china and i'm being working in america but one thing had been happened gradually and it's it's only going to happen more often is international collaboration um because uh largely because internet makes high speed internet makes it a lot easier and people start to realize the benefits of working like internationally because um you can have like for example i work with a lot of team in australia and i will just do my development and i will hand them over to, like before i get off work and they will get up and they will start working as a result you have um a lot of people who's always working on the game to improve it but nobody needs to crunch so a lot of time international collaboration is a good solution to um you know work life balance and um other stuff but also it also helps with when during covid every com country has their own lockdown schedule and we were able to make some board game by working around lockdown schedule during covid um there has been like a lot of benefits when it comes to international collaboration. Not not just like you are you have access to a global source of talent. You have talent who actually speak the late native language, who understand the market. Um, and it's always better to have someone who's from that market, from the audience, to give you a suggestion rather than being an outsider and trying to like 
game understanding the player habits and stuff um but also like we get to learn you know different working culture different communication culture in different countries um however there's also a lot of um pitfalls or like develop like production depth when it comes to international collaboration that people don't always like notice um culture and language use is a big one just because everyone speak english doesn't mean they use the English the same way you do. Sometimes um, I will say things where my manager will be like, oh, don't say this because they will kind of, like perceive it as rude. So um, like we said, open-minded. Open-minded is actually, actually important when you work for international collaboration because the chances are you don't really have that many exposure to this culture before collaboration. And um, being able to keep open-minded and being able to communicate um, past misunderstanding is very, very important. Um, every country has their own labor policies, what is considered full-time work, what is considered overtime are very different. Time zone is a big one. Um, I work remote, which is really, really helpful because sometimes I have to like get up a little bit earlier or go to bed a little bit later just so I we can have important discussion um, happening. And always um, I have a separate calendar that I keep track about time in other time zones. So we so I I don't like bug someone when they're in their sleep. <laughs> Internet freedom, um, when we work with people uh, from countries where they have heavy censorship, a lot of reference we share with them, they may not understand, and the link we send them, they may just not able to un open. Um, local religious holidays, um, as someone living in America, I'm very aware about holidays in America. I am not that aware about holidays in Canada, Australia, or India. Um, so we always have to like production producers are the one who has to proactively uh, communicate and inform other people and just because you know everyone get off on 4th of July doesn't mean someone in England understand what 4th of July is so always be very proactive when it comes to like times off and holidays and like time like the time you need to like maybe stall the development a little bit um currencies is very important because um every country they charge in their own currency and sometimes currency change can largely impact your budget um and also your like business plan and, pr and like prediction so always leave a little bit wiggle room when you treat, like do international collaboration understand like the cost is not always predictable and also policies and like we as a gaming industry has seen a lot of impact as happened with the war in Russia. Um, I can go into this later uh, detail, but like basically a lot of stuff that you rely on when we rely on a lot of stuff happening in Ukraine. We work with a lot of people in Ukraine and when the war happened, um, of course, we have to understand that they are not going to deliver the stuff we asked for and for very good reason. And being able to adjust and like replace um, some of the workers who are not able to work because politics reason are also something we have to put in consideration when it comes to like game production planning. Um, but there's a lot of good come out of it. And I do I do, do not think international collaboration is going to go anywhere. And I think it's only going to happen more and more often uh, in the next couple of years. 100%. Thank you. Oh, it's been it's been a great opportunity to like, you know, hang out and talk. And and thanks to Monica for cluing me in that this was going on. And, and, and thanks to you, the player, yeah. for coming in and listening to us. Um, We'll try to be present during this, uh, during this uh, for questions and in the chat, et cetera. So um, come by, say hi. Yes, you can also find us on socials, um, Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, everything is under this name. And if you have any question af afterwards, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. So did that talk make you a little more interested in co-development? I honestly didn't even know that that was an option before this talk. It seems like a really great way to get a start in the industry or try some new skills, take on some unexpected challenges, just all very cool. Thank you so much for your talk, Monica and Ken.